Live for yourself. Is that phrase selfish or selfless? I'm not trying to wax poetic here. I'm asking a sincere question. After all, if you live for yourself, you become less of a burden on other people. Your end game with that mentality is to be self-sufficient. Conversely though, it can also estrange you from loved ones. There's gonna be a clear disconnect if you live for yourself entirely and cut other people out. That is selfish. On the reverse side of this pendulum, we have living for others, something that sounds wonderful on the very premise. I mean, you're helping people all the time and making their lives better. What could be more sublime? Well, that's all well and good on an idealistic level. The way Madoka Magica explores this ideology doesn't trade hands with idealism. Also aligns with how I myself view this little conundrum. Sayaka, as she's shown from the first episode, is someone who lives a life very selflessly. Her innate response to danger is always to protect those who are in need of it. An objectively good person doesn't think twice about what to make her wish for. When Music Lad is shown early on with his fucked up hand crying about not being able to achieve his dream anymore, she feels for that. She wants him to recapture that old radiance. So she makes the contract, saying that there's no way she'll ever regret it. Another question, is there not a tinge of selfishness to her actions? They create a net benefit in the end, no doubt, but her act seeks only to benefit her in the long run. She's been by the lad's side since seemingly he's been put out of commission, and it's obvious that she wants to be rewarded for her efforts in a romantic sense. That rationalization that she should get something for her actions is the birth of a cancerous mindset. Selfless acts are a wonderful thing, and often they do only lead to positive outcomes. The person doing the act feels a sense of pride that they helped someone, and that someone, well, they received kindness. It's a nice little system for things like holding the door open for people, but not so much for things like, say, selling your soul to make someone else happy. In that instance, you'll never really get a payout for the energy put in, meaning that the only thing coming into effect is the law of entropy. If you don't live for yourself a little, if you don't balance out, then eventually you'll just be a husk of what used to be good intentions. It's my own outlook on selfishness versus selflessness. It's better to live for yourself, helping those around you when you have the ability. That way, the main effect had on the world is others not sucking the life out of you, and you not being a sap on others. To know on Chagrin, my favorite character in this show is Kyoko Sakada, the most selfish whore of them all. Now, that's not derogatory, mind you. I mean it in only the most loving way as a selfish whore myself. I synchronize to almost an exact level with her outlook on life, and all the more with the answer she reaches by the end of her own. She comes into the show right after Sayaka makes her selfless wish and shakes things up in a fucking brilliant way. It's like she's immediately answering the question of if Sayaka was correct in the wish she chose. Spoilers, she wasn't. Neither was Kyoko with hers though. Of all the big dynamics in the show, Madoka and Homura, Taiga and Madoka's mom, Mami and Charlotte, Kyoko and Sayaka's goes that extra mile. That initial confrontation during episode five, what comes to mind immediately when they're juxtaposed with one another? Personally, it's that these two appear to be polar opposites. What's known about Sayaka from the first few episodes is that she's swift to protect her friends, but fragile at protecting her inner self. Sharp as a blade, weak as an eggshell. Meanwhile, Kyoko's introduction is like a villain's pissed at Sayaka even making a debut as a Maho Shoujo. Take note of where she is, high up a tower, alone and looking down at them judgmentally. She doesn't have any friends and clearly prefers to keep to herself when she's able. She's gonna make Sayaka think about herself, make her frantic in a fight because Kyoko is strong where Sayaka isn't. Kyoko's got that inner self thing way further along. Though it's not in its final form, it's more apt to compare it to Steel when looking at its counterpart in Sayaka. 
When actually face to face with the cast, the differences between the two are made more stark, notably in designs. Kyoko's magical girl getup is a sleek red Chinese dress, accentuating that her fiery combat style is likely going to be refined and focus on hard hitting strikes, fueled by the burning passion she puts behind each blow. Contrast this to Sayaka's. Well, oh, my mind wants to say pirate for some reason, though I guess adventurer clothes would be more apt. Regardless, it's lacking in that air of elegance and adeptness. Sayaka is not as experienced. Her combat style is like the water, in that it relies on rushing strikes that flow into a relentless assault. Weaker, but faster. When put up against Kyoko's overwhelming competence and penchant for making Sayaka irrational, that means nothing. To simplify, Kyoko Red, Sayaka Blue. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Moving on, why all these differences? What is the point? Well, my dear watcher, the point is that all these differences make the revelation that these two are essentially the same character hit oh so nicely. Well, not exactly the same. They're more like different answers to the same question. The similarities in their backstories do a wonderful job of showing where Sayaka could end up if she just picks herself back up. Both made their contract for a loved one, both just wanted to see other people happy, and both ended up burned by their wishes. It was a noble cause, so why did it end up so badly? Both rack their brains over that. No more details are needed other than the rudimentary backstory Kyoko gives about her preacher father. The symmetry between these two has gradually been ramping up, so it's obvious what place Kyoko went to mentally after said events. Her talk to Sayaka when she's standing outside of Music Lad's house is the first of many an occurrence in which she offers her own reality pushing, fuck your little baby ideals, they're dumb and cringe advice. God, she's such a girl boss, I fucking love her. She tells Sayaka to storm in there and cripple him again, make him rely on her because that's what she really wanted from the get go. It's blunt and obviously no one's going to act on it. It's the truth though. At least in some form or fashion, a selfless act she did while what she wanted was the selfish desire underneath. Happiness can be attained vicariously through love or family. It doesn't have to be a self-made thing. This ties into what I said at the beginning of the section, however. The happiness from friends and family, though a wonderful thing to have, is ultimately temporary. It will not sustain forever. Sayaka can't rely on other people for those positive emotions forever. She can't live vicariously. Those other people are going to have their off days, ergo she's going to have the same off days, and it's going to be worse because then you'll feel like an emotional drain to those people, which is an important thing to note because, well, you are. That's not to say other people don't want to help you, though. They do. Sometimes you just gotta be in the right headspace to do so is all. Sheesh. As a side note, I say you a lot in these videos, specifically that last paragraph. But honestly, I'm just talking to my past self when I get into diatribes like this. Anyhow, Sayaka is shown in that kind of state. She derives her self-worth from others, yet is constantly cutting them out. She's stuck in the mentality of living selflessly because that's all she's ever done. She derives herself up a wall because living selfishly, even though she really needs to, feels antithetical to who she is. It's that mentality that pushes happiness further and further away from her. People work like amplifiers, taking the emotions put into them and transforming them into their own. With an infectious personality like Sayaka's, she transmits the feelings she has into everyone else around her. If she's put into a mental state where she can't feel anything but numbness, and she also can't derive her joy from those around her, well, she's just gonna keep falling down. She's stuck in a feedback loop with a broken wire. Everyone coattails off of her feelings, and she coattails off of theirs. She has her high moments, but those lows come crashing down when Madoka can do nothing but cry for her. And that's not the fault of anyone else. Sometimes all you can do is cry for your loved ones. Words just don't convey raw emotion sometimes. You can't put things into words and that's okay. We have thousands of different languages on this planet. None of them can adequately convey emotion. 
It's this raw, visceral thing that you just can't codify. Humans have literally spent thousands of years trying to do so, and yet we still can't understand each other. It's crazy. However, codifying things isn't always important. Putting them into words and consoling someone, you know, on this emotional level, isn't always important. This is where my girl comes in. Kyoko can see that Sayaka is slipping. Unlike everyone else in the cast who might try to console her and talk to her though, Kyoko takes an active role in helping Sayaka. Be it because she sees a bit of herself in Sayaka, or because she empathizes with her initially because of Kyuubi's antics, Kyoko does something. And when she does something, she puts her fucking mind to it. She's selfish, arrogant, mean-spirited at times, but Kyoko has helped herself plenty. She's now in the position where she can help someone else with reckless abandon. It's a beautiful little thing and ties into that ongoing theme. You can't help others if you don't help yourself. Even then, you can't beat yourself up if the person on the receiving end refuses to take your hand when they're on the ground. It's okay to get frustrated when that happens, but don't take it out on yourself. Humans are very fickle creatures. You can't always know how someone's going to react in a situation. It's foolish to even think you can. Humanity itself is this vast, ever-changing tapestry. Sometimes it changes in unexpected ways. Life takes turns you're not expecting. Can you do, though? That's just the break sometimes. What's important is that you just keep moving forward can't let yourself be beat up forever. It's okay to cope, but don't waste your entire life coping. It took me years to learn that. Literal years I spent coping, just unable to move on from stuff. I had an experience recently and I just see the world differently now. I'm able to keep a consistent upload schedule now with good videos. It's because I finally got out of that headspace. Hope you're all doing all right. I have a question for you, dear viewer. What immediately comes to mind when I say the words Gen or Ibuchi work? Is it despair? A tight-knit and solid cast of characters? Both are correct, for the most part, Jesus Christ fuck Sayano Uta, but personally, it's rape. I admittedly have not consumed too terribly many Gen Urobuchi works, but in the stuff I have, Fate Zero, Sayano Uta, Black Lagoon, each and every one has, or was going to have, rape in it. Madoka, whether you realize it or not, also follows this trend. The way Sayaka reacts to the realization that her body and soul have been disconnected from one another is how a sexual assault victim might react after the assault. She breaks down and stares at her soul gem, recognizing that her body really is just a corpse now. It's been sullied, so in her mind, it doesn't deserve to be held, kissed, or loved. It just deserves nothing. She actively takes Kyubei's advice and tries to dissociate 24-7. Once she does so, she makes a proclamation that it doesn't hurt anymore. This is what starts Sayaka's descent down the spiral, pushed further by her friend What's-Her-Name taking away the one person she made her wish for, which stings for sure, but not nearly as much as her initial response to the situation in thinking, what if I let her die? The thought scares her. It makes her realize that her wish was inherently selfish if that's where it was going to lead her. More than anything though, for the first time, she now regrets every little thing. So, she makes a heel turn and decides to throw herself completely into helping other people, never herself. All these factors are jumbling about in her mind, so that's all she feels she's any good for now. She doesn't deserve comfort, and in fact, would only rob other people of theirs by being near them. She saw how Madoka cried at seeing her, so she pushed everyone away. She, ironically, becomes selfish in an extremely toxic way. The scene in which she snaps and fully disconnects her body from herself during combat is such a striking scene. It's the no return point for Sayaka. The silhouettes used let her violent actions speak more than an expression or words ever could. And my god, the voice acting for both the sub and dub sink into such an unhinged state that when put together with Sayaka swinging her swords with reckless abandon, 
Well, hell, what can you say other than that she's completely and utterly broken? And no, she hasn't achieved a broken brilliance. She's broken, broken. She becomes a machine. That fact could save her for a time if she really threw herself into saving people and maintaining her ability to do so. Unfortunately, as I said, Sayaka is broken. She has no self-worth. And, you know, she gets a disillusioned from even doing the basic things she set out to do. The people she's been giving her life for, with a few scarce exceptions like Madoka, are nothing but vile pieces of filth that don't value what's right in front of them. They're wretched, disgusting, not worth the time of day to even glance at. What is the point of going so far for them? The world is so ugly. This is, again, where Kyoko steps in for one last attempt to talk Sayaka through things. It's a glimmer of hope before the obvious happens. I love little moments like this. She's a real hardhead, but it is clear as crystal how much she cares for Sayaka. She makes things comfortable in her own way, offering food and a return to normalcy to Sayaka. She is a social genius, despite how she might seem. The first thing she does here is try to defuse Sayaka's rushing mind, you know, before she gets into the deeper topics. Also, her demeanor here makes it so clear that the implication is that she spent nights awake thinking about how to do this conversation right. Sayaka's headspace was like the end of Ava. Tumbling down, tumbling down, tumbling down. With Kyoko, she might be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Being a magical girl blows. Like a lot. Pros first. You get a wish granted. Cute outfit. That's important. Magical powers and, uh, unlimited tea and cake. I guess. Not a bad thing, but... Cons. Include, you get dehumanized and saddled with crippling dysphoria, relatable. You get to fight witches forever, constant fear of needing grief seeds, no time with friends, you will probably die. If you aren't 100% sure about your wish, it will probably bite you in the butt. If you don't die, you will become a witch. You're actually just a battery for a gaggle of space races, and you always have this psychotic furball with you. Now, I don't know about you, but the tea and cake really ain't looking too hot. Granted, if you have a really good wish that changes the fabric of reality, you'd likely be set. Though, that's literally not going to be anyone except the last Maho Shoujo. Kyoko and Sayaka are not that. They tried their best with what they had, but they can't alter fate. I bring this all up because it lays the groundwork for my favorite bit of this series. Just full stop. Sayaka's transformation, or better to say death, hits Kyoko harder than it hits even Madoka. She can't move on from it, carrying the body to where she's staying and maintaining it. She's holding on to the hope that Sayaka can come back through some kind of miracle. As well established with the show though, Madoka isn't the kind of series that's gonna go and break its rules without a damn good reason. Hoping for a miracle just isn't going to cut it. Kyoko's doing all this out of some internal mix of empathy, guilt, and dumb optimism. She could have easily been where Sayaka is now if her headstrong mentality didn't kick into gear when it did. The odds of it working are negligible. But fuck it. Gather all the cliches. Get her best friend to tell Sayaka to come back. Keep the body fresh. Get out all your emotions in one final fight where you both make up and things become happy again. Something has to work. Of course, Madoka's pleas aren't going to reach a witch. This creature on screen, dotting your peripheral, isn't Sayaka anymore. Her regrets, fears, and hate have all taken on physical form. Sayaka could have gotten herself out of this if she took the advice of Kyoko or leaned on Madoka a little, yet that headstrong personality of hers persisted in the worst possible way it could have. And of course, this is me saying things with the benefit of hindsight, 
As I said earlier, emotions are never this finite thing that you can always rely on or always structured. Emotions are not rational. All of me saying this is not a detriment to our character. Characters can have flaws and still be compelling. Scratch that, that's what makes them compelling. Absolutely insane, right? Anyhow, <laughs> Sayaka put herself into where she is now. So it's no coincidence that her witch self is conducting the elegy of her sorrowful life. Her wish forever haunts her, forcing her to bask in the gloomy muck for all eternity, till someone comes along and puts her out of her misery. It's all so delightful. Seriously, when it all comes together like this, I totally get what Urobuchi's philosophy is going for. This stuff is so good in how it pays off the tragedy of Sayaka's character arc. Mami served to introduce the concepts of what a magical girl is, but Sayaka really claws in the point that this is not a fun thing. It will ruin your life every single time and is fated to end tragically with the system in place. Until someone comes along to change that, Sayaka is everyone's eventual endpoint. <laughs> well, if they don't go off and die before that. Within every Urobuchi work, however, there is always a bittersweet comfort underlying all that negativity. In the case of Sayaka, it comes in the form of Kyoko. Not to give all the credit to Mr. Despair, the director and storyboard artist respectfully for this episode were Masahiro Mukai and Noriko Shishishima, who, unless I am mistaken, are the two responsible for this, simply put, beautiful moment of Sayaka and Kyoko's silhouettes mixing together as Kyoko recounts their short time with one another, ending in it turning into the blood pouring out of her. These two have become intrinsically intertwined, they have the ability to help each other and make a better future for one another. Kyoko was more well-adjusted than Sayaka, but she's also been doing this longer, and is used to fucked up things happening to her and those around her. Hence why she's able to blow off the revelation that her body's just a shell. Sayaka, though, she's just been dropped into all this. It's been like, what, a week? Everything's hitting her back and forth, and she just can't catch a break. Seeing all that makes Kyoko want to reach out and save her. Kyoko was clearly too selfish at the start. The perfect counter to Sayaka. It's because of that that they counterbalance each other so well. Take the scene where she brushes off what happened to their bodies and explains her reasoning. She's not doing it in a deep or contemplative way. She's giving her outlook and praying that Sayaka sees the benefits of her thought process. You know, not that she'll necessarily just start thinking like Kyoko, but just showing her side of things, showing her that not everything is this a deep, contemplative process. It's been fucking rough for Sayaka. Kyoko is aware of that. You know, she's just offering like this easier way of thinking, you know, showing that not everything has to be so goddamn difficult all the time. She's blunt in how she she's blunt in how she goes about it, but she's offering Sayaka a kind of cheat sheet to skip all the painful bits now that she's fallen into the trap of being a magical girl. When looking at the second fight they have, Sayaka, now a witch, Kyoko learns the value of helping other people when the chance arises. It's not something you can do all the time, and granted, it's burned out of seeing a bit of herself in Sayaka, but still, the drive to help someone out when they're in the same spot you once were shows immense character development on her part. It's what I love about Madoka Magica. These characters evolve and grow. Every little thing influences them. In this instance, that influence just came a little too late, which... Fuck, that ain't life sometimes. Sayaka going off the deep end is what lets Kyoko put the reasons for her interest in Sayaka into words. Kyoko's selfless wish left her an emotional wreck with a no one to help her through it. It's not unreasonable to draw the conclusion from Kyoko not having anyone to lean on to her personality at her introduction. Self-reliance drew her to seclusion and self-reflection at the actions of Sayaka led her to where she is now. If talking to Sayaka in a roundabout way to give advice won't do the trick, if searching for her and reaching out when she's at her lowest won't do it, and especially if all that cliché bullshit won't do it, all that's left is to take on Sayaka's bitterness and help her carry that weight. Something she likely wished someone would do for her at some point. Empathy's a hell of a drug. Kyoko doesn't offer any words of false comfort or tell Sayaka what she wanted to hear. She just understands. 
All the hate, sadness, and regret that led Sayaka to become the witch she is now. Kyoko gets it. She can't and won't stop reaching out an arm to bring her back for that reason. It's not a selfish act on her part anymore. A little bit of empathy kickstarted all this, but truthfully, she just wants to see Sayaka happy at this point. I find it beautiful that this is the one time either of these two do something that is unabatably selfless. It's the perfect way to wrap things up and gets across the emotion that these two share. It's not portrayed in this overly flowery way where everything is bright and works out. It's not shown in the stereotypical way where opposites meet and suddenly realize they have more in common than they thought. It's a real clusterfuck. And hey, that's love. Yeah, love. Not in the overt romantic, when will they kiss fashion, but in the deep connection with one another and drive to make one another the best they can be kind of fashion. The good stuff. What I'd view as the difference between a dumb high school crush and something real. This little arc of the two share was really well thought out and conveyed in a stellar manner. What really sells it for me though is the credit sequence. It returns to the still image style the first two episodes had, and this works wonderfully for two reasons. One, look at this art. Just look at it. If I wasn't staring at a script right now, I'd probably be tearing up. And two, the first two episodes showed Sayaka at her most innocent and happy. She and Kyoko might both be dead now, but everything Sayaka did wasn't for nothing. She didn't die alone in her regrets. She had someone there with her, holding her and guiding her every step of the way. It's fitting that the final curtain for her be returned when she could smile. The track being called And I'm Home is equally as romantic. Home is where the heart is, and these two have a home in one another. My content creation is like a fire on one of those Everlast logs. It'll keep burning forever, but if you would like to fuel that fire and make this content burn even brighter, patreon.com slash sleepy underscore crest. Link in the description. Also, like, share, and comment on the video. Tell me your thoughts. Who's your favorite character in Madoka Magica? If it's not Kyoko, I'm sorry for your being wrong, but, you know, give a good argument. Tell me your reasoning. We'll have a little discussion. I like having discussions in the comments. Every time I get to interact with any of you, it's always a fucking blessing. Even if it's an argument, you know. Good shit. You know, it's always fun. I will see you all soon. Have a wonderful night.